So, open the schnubler, close the schnubler. <laughs> Sorry for the delay, but I mean, we're happy that we're walking, or I'm happy that I'm still walking. <laughs> so, um, I never feel so frustrated in my life, but at the end it was better. Um, what I will do is, uh, I will go the other way around as I plan to have the lectures. I ask everybody to give an introductory lecture first and then a more specific thing. I will do the specific one now and I want to do the introductory at the end because I want to keep it short to maybe have discussions. And I will play my game. I will be controversial because I know that Jadine will jump on me and say, no, you're wrong and that will be fun then. Then we can have a beer and if you're right, I'll pay you a beer. If I don't know, whatever. So, Basically, I will tell you about what I start showing you in the tutorial. I will tell you about neurons in the human brain and how they respond to different things. Again, how do we record neurons in the human brain? Uh, we take advantage, if you want, for clinical cases where people have to implant electrodes in patients for clinical reasons to try to cure them from epilepsy. And they implant electrodes like, like this one here. And if you look at it in detail, that's actually a little coin, a penny or so. Uh, this is how the electrode looks like. I mean, the thickness of the electrode is about one millimeter. And this is done since decades in many places. I mean, since, I mean, everywhere. I mean, everywhere, everyone is doing that. Because that's the main thing you will do for a patient that is candidate to epilepsy surgery. The idea is that you remove the epileptic focus and you're likely to cure the patient. And why I say that, because in many cases, epileptic seizures, they happen to come from an area that we hear about today called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is critical for memory, but it's also pretty much involved in epilepsy. So in many cases, when they do not know and they want to make sure where the seizures come from to evaluate the potential rejection, they will end up putting electrodes in the hippocampus because the hippocampus it tends to be a usual suspect, right? And something that was developed by Isaac Fried at UCLA is that he has microwires going through these um, macro electrodes, as we call them. And from this one, these are about 40 microns, we can record single neurons. That's the trick. Now, can we choose how many of these electrodes we have and the exact location of where these electrodes should be? No, we cannot do that. We, I mean, it's unethical to do that. So the position of these electrodes is exclusively determined by clinical criteria. It's just to cure the patient. But as I said, it happens that in many, many cases, they end up in the hippocampus, which is quite interesting. So why is the hippocampus interesting? There are many ways of saying that, but I think that's the brutal one. I mean, I guess you have seen this picture before from my best Vanessa and colleagues. The hippocampus is here. And here is the entoronal cortex, which is another area we record from. This is what Jardine called today the hippocampal formation. We also call it medial temporal lobe. It's hippocampus, entoronal cortex, uh, parhippocampal cortex, amygdala, right? So this picture reminds me to tell you two or three things. First thing is what I'm showing you is not magic. It's not that I will show you some neurons that they have some particular properties which make them do very crazy things, no. What happens is that the neurons, they happen to be in the top of a hierarchy, right? So the data that comes to this neuron has been processed by many, many data, by many, many areas before. Actually, let me do a sign mark of this. This is a bit misleading because it's not like that. It's not that the information ends in the hippocampus and that's it. I mean, of course, from the hippocampus, information goes back, there's feedback, and it goes to other areas, prefrontal cortex and so on. But what I do want to show you is that when a visual stimulus is perceived by the first the retina and so on. It goes through many visual areas and then comes to the hippocampus, right? The final point is that the neurons I will show you, they are not alone. You will hear, I mean, in one or two slides, you will hear about the famous Jennifer Aniston neuron. It's not that the representation of Jennifer Aniston is, oops. So it's not that the representation of Jennifer Aniston is here in these neurons and nowhere else in the brain. I will never say that, right? So there's always an interaction between these areas and the rest of cortex in this case. Okay, well, let's, let's move straight to the data. So what happens? We put these electrodes, so the surgeon puts these electrodes, we have these microwires, and the experiments we do are very simple. We just show pictures to start with, right? Now we're doing more complexing, but the first experiment was just showing pictures. So we go with my laptop, the patient is in bed, or we put it in, a, in our, our tray table in front of the patient. We will show just pictures. And this is a very cool neuron. This is a neuron in the amygdala of one of the patients. This is a real recording. And the neuron fired to a... Uh, 
Eh? They were pushing me to start. I don't understand the sport people, that we need some time. But I didn't say much, so you didn't miss much. So um, this neuron, for example, this is the high-pass filter data. Remember that I told you that you have to high-pass filter to see the, the neurons firing. We show a picture of Brad Pitt, the neuron does nothing. And that's the time I show the picture, it's one second. But then I show a picture of Maradona, and the neuron goes crazy. I, I hope you know who Maradona is. I show a picture of another sportman from Argentina, a bas basketball player, Manu Ginobili, the neuron doesn't fire. I show a picture of Robert Plant, I hope you know who Robert Plant is. Actually, the patient was a big fan of Led Zeppelin, that's why I used these pictures. The neuron didn't do anything, but then I show Maradona again, and the neuron goes crazy again. So, these neurons, in these very high areas, they respond very strongly to visual stimuli. That's the first point we can make. And now comes two technical points which are key. The first one I already talked about, which was the tutorial. You will barely see, I mean, you, you will very, very seldom see a recording like this. This is not the typical case. It's good to illustrate, it's good to show you what happens, but it's never like that. Because this, you see here only one neuron firing. Typically, when you do a recording, you will see many neurons, and you have to do what I told you before, this, all this trick of, of spike sorting and so on. That's okay, we talked about this already. We have a good code and it works. But now comes the second problem. The second problem is that the neuron fires so sparsely that you may wonder what would have happened if I wouldn't have shown the picture of Maradona. Imagine I show 100 pictures, but the picture of Maradona is not there. Well, I wouldn't have seen this neuron. I would have missed it. So I put an electrode. There's a neuron here encoding Maradona, one out of many. But if I don't show the picture of Maradona, the neuron is completely silent. So I will never listen to this neuron. I will never notice this neuron. So how do we know which pictures we should use? Well, we don't know. That's the answer. But we can try to tune experiments to try to start having a guess of what the neurons might be doing. And, okay, this I show already. When me, when me 10 slides and ask me the question again, if, if I don't answer it, because that now it comes that. Yes. Um, Rodrigo, can I ask a conceptual question? Yes. So in the monkeys, what we find is that cells are activated in hippocampus if the monkey is doing a hippocampal dependent task, yes. such as object and place. Yes. And then the cells get tuned into objects. Yes. Now what I wonder is exactly what the setup is here. So there isn't a task that's being performed, but did that particular patient yeah. have some particular interest in Maradona? Yes. Because if so, you, she see, did. Yeah, you see, that is exactly what I would predict from what happens in the monkey, because effectively this patient was engaged in that type of task, then that may be why in that patient a neuron happened to, <coughs> to Maradona. Now, the question, let me see if I can rephrase the question if, if I understand it correctly. What you are saying is that this neuron is encoding the concept or the, the person in a particular context? Or you mean something else? Well, let's phrase it as a Maradona thing. Yeah. So if I associated Maradona with a reward, then yeah. in a monkey, the neuron wouldn't respond. Yeah. But if I associate Maradona with something like a place or yeah. a time, yeah. then object cells are much more responsive. Yeah. So what I was wondering was, in that particular patient, does the patient have some particular interest that would engage the hippocampus in Maradona? No, because I can tell you about this. Um, okay, I'm, I'm advancing too far. Let me again, let me pass a few slides. Let me, let me make the first story, and then, and then we start discussing it, because I will start answering you without showing you the data. So, yeah. It's an excellent question. Give me 10 slides. Because, <laughs> yeah, j just, le let me just make the technical point. I want to stop with the technical point now because if I, if I move straight into your questions, you will miss why we get these neurons. They will look like magic and they're not magic. I mean, it's a very simple story, but let me, let me tell you the story of why. Now, 
This is an example that is like the Maradona neuron. The Maradona I just show you a little bit, like, like a few seconds. This I show you the whole recording. The whole recording, you know, the best responses during the whole recording. Here I show about 100 pictures and the neuron fire only to the map of Italy. I don't know if you can see that. This is time where I show the picture, this is baseline, and this is the response. And it goes from absolute zero to 40, 50 hertz. And if I show anything else, there's absolutely nothing. So they are extremely, extremely sparse and they are very silent until you show the right picture, right? And that makes them hard to detect. Then you have to do a very good sorting because these spikes are not that many compared to a neuron that is next to it that is firing like crazy, right? That's the technical challenge. Now, the experimental challenge, and then I will go to the next experiment, I will try to answer your, your, your three questions. The experimental channel is, well, how do we know which, which pictures like this one we should use? We don't know. So what we do is, or we, we, we started doing like some time ago, I said, well, okay, let's, let's go and show many pictures, as many as possible, and then let's see what the neurons do. And we call this a screening session. We're just screening, we're seeing what happens. So this is one example, the most famous example of all. This is a recording I did like already like 10, 15 years ago at UCLA. And there's a, another patient, not the Maradona patient, uh, this is a neuron in the hippocampus of this patient, and I show many different things. I show about 100 things, but I'm showing you 15 here. The neuron doesn't fire to different people, uh, different places, animals, uh, different people, different female faces, but it fires very strongly to Jennifer Aniston in this case. So there are many interesting issues about this response. First, if you will, de if we'll zoom into here, you will see that the onset from here is very late. It's 300 milliseconds. And I come back to this at the very end, keep it in mind. And the response can be very short. Now, I start addressing your questions. So one of the first questions you can ask, which you also ask with Maradona is, wait, wait, wait a minute, you will say, how do you know this neuron is firing to Jennifer Aniston and not to this picture of Jennifer Aniston? There's a difference. Why? Because for example, we know that in monkeys, there are neurons in B4 that fire two different colors. I mean, that's hippocampus, but it wouldn't be surprising that if this neuron will fire to blue. And since it's the only picture that has blue, maybe the neuron is firing to this picture because it has blue, right? So the same with Maradona. How do I know that the neuron is firing to Maradona and not to this specific picture of Maradona, right? So the trick is very simple. We spend some time making the analysis of this data, getting these plots very quickly. So all the spike sorting and stuff, we can do it very quickly and automatically. Therefore, the importance of spike sorting. And I will get this result maybe, now we get it like half an hour after finishing the recording. So once I know I have this, the trick is very simple. I just go to Google Images, get many pictures of Jennifer Aniston as different as possible, and repeat the experiment. This is what I did 15 years ago. This is what we still do now routinely for the different experiments we do. Now the question is the following. Are the neurons responding to visual features, like the blue color, or are they responding to the concept, to the identity of the person? So we did exactly as I said. And the challenge is that we have to be fast. We have to go quickly and record again because this recording, they may not be stable. So if I take too long, I may lose the neuron. So if we are fast enough, we get things like that. I'm recording from the same neuron later, and I see that the neuron fires to many different pictures of Jennifer Aniston. Look at the baseline again. There's nothing in the baseline, but the moment I show the picture, any of these seven pictures, the neuron fires very strongly, right? And the pictures, they are as different as I could get by doing a Google Images search in, I mean, in, in internet. I tried to get them as different as possible, went back, repeat the experiment, and show many other pictures. No, show many pictures of Julia Roberts, of Kobe Bryant, show over 100 pictures again, sorry, but not many pictures of the same person. So the neuron seems to prefer Jennifer Aniston, this neuron, right? Another example, another neuron. This one, in this case, we did the screening and the neuron like Halle Berry. Right, the actress, the American actress. Same trick, we went to Google Images, we got many pictures of Halle Berry, and we repeated the experiment. And we wanted to see if the neuron fires to this picture or to any picture of Halle Berry. So this is what we found. I mean, I'm showing you the best responses. We show about 100 pictures or so. So the neuron fires to four different pictures of Halle Berry. It fires to a cartoon of her, and we use a cartoon on purpose because we, the cartoon distorts the features of Halle Berry, but you can still recognize it as Halle Berry. The patient still recognizes this as Halle Berry. And funnily enough, he, we use pictures of Halle Berry dressed as Catwoman, which is a film she released. And the patient knew that that was Halle Berry. I mean, we asked him later. And the neuron also fires to that, although you can not see her face really. But the patient knew that that was Halle Berry. And now comes the most interesting one. 
if we want to prove that the neuron is falling to concept, since we're dealing with humans, we can do something very simple. We can write the name of the person. So then there are no features or visual stuff or anything anymore. It's the concept. And we did that. And this is the response we got when we wrote the name Halle Berry. Very strong. And if you write something else, like Catwoman, there's no response. Uh, I don't remember. George Bush here. Oprah Winfrey, I don't know. Uh, there's no response. So the neuron seems to be firing to the concept. I will show you one more piece of data, and then we can stop, and we, we can challenge this data, if you, if you like, because then I will move to something else. Now, one thing that it looks like obvious, but if you think about it, it's not that obvious, is to ask yourself, what happens if now, in, instead of writing the name, you will say the name? You say, well, it's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. It's a different sensory modality. If I write the name, it goes through vision, visual pathway. I mean, it's not the same as when you're processing a picture, but it's more or less the visual pathway. <laughs> if I say the name, of course, for us it's the same concept, but it goes from the ears to temporal cortex, and it has a completely different sensory pathway. And we know that these two pathways, they get to the hippocampus. The question at the time was, will they get to the same neurons? Will the different sensory modalities activate the same neurons? So that's what we tried. And... Uh, so, i show you a few examples. So, in this case, we had a neuron firing to Oprah Winfrey. We used these pictures because we did these recordings at UCLA. I mean, where it's like, I mean, that's, that's the surgery, it's a freed. And these people are very, very familiar to the patients. That's why we use them, right? Jennifer Aniston, Halle Berry, Oprah Winfrey, and so on. All the patients will know who these people are, right? Look at the basin again. The basin is zero. I show the picture of Oprah Winfrey, and the response is very strong. Right? I show any picture and the, I have a good response. I write the name, I get a good response. I say the name, I mean the computer says the name, I get a good response as well. Let's see if you can hear that. Uh, that's exactly what the patient heard. Oprah. I don't know if you heard that. It's my laptop saying Oprah. Every time my laptop said Oprah, the you know will fire. And when the laptop says something else, Cameron Diaz. like Cameron Diaz, the you know will not fire. So we intermix pictures with names, with uh, names written and names spoken. And now we can break if you like and we can, we can discuss. Yes? I have two questions. So on one hand, what would happen if you have the voice of Oprah with me? Yeah. Would the patients also recognize that because they connect like, to that person to their voice? I think so. We didn't try it because the experiment gets trickier because then we have to find a speech of Oprah. We have to make sure the patient knows. The main limitation we have with these recordings is that we don't have too much time because you have to think that the patients are there. They're going to go potentially to surgery. They have electrodes implanted. Their family members coming to visit them and they're there for clinical reasons. So we try to be as quickly as possible. And for us, I mean, we stop here. I mean, we have tons of neurons like this, but I, I can show you another example. Whatever triggers the concept, the neurons fire. Yeah. I can show you another example that is very brutal about that. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, if they can hear the voice, if, they, if that would trigger the same time. Or also, if you would say, like, the character's name, what they, like, for instance, for Halle Berry, if you say Catwoman, it's the same neuron fire. Let me see if I find it. Uh, Well, I cannot really see what I have here. I don't have it here. Okay, I have to find it. I, I wish, I mean, I will find you a neuron. I will show you after the break. I have to find it in, in the presentation. Anything that triggers the concept, the neuron will fire. I mean, I mean it's, it's like that. So, yep. I think when you were showing the Jennifer Aniston, you also showed pictures that was Jennifer Aniston with Brad Pitt. Oh yeah, and then you're uh, you know the story. Right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's That's because, can, can you cut the, f no, 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 you can film, you can film. <laughs> but I will say something that will shock you. The Jennifer Aniston neuron did not fire to Jennifer Aniston. It's not a Jennifer Aniston neuron. That's how we know it, but it didn't fire to Jennifer Aniston. The Jennifer Aniston neuron fired to Rachel, which is the character she played in the TV series Friends. I'm, I'm damn serious, it's hard to prove, but the reason why I tell you this is because I wrote the name Jennifer Aniston, the neuron didn't fire to the name Jennifer Aniston. I didn't write Rachel, I didn't, I didn't think about that, I thought about this later, but I couldn't do the recording again. I retested the neuron the day after, 
the neuron was uh, still there. And the neuron fired also to Lisa Kudrow, who was a co-actress. I mean, it was also a star in the same TV series, Friends, Phoebe. Now, the moment I put Jennifer Aniston with Brad Pitt, it puzzled me because it's like, well, no matter how I judge Jennifer Aniston, the neuron fires. But then I will put Brad Pitt next to it, and the neuron won't fire anymore. Because the moment I will put Brad Pitt next to her, she's not Rachel anymore. She's Jennifer Aniston. And it was a different concept for the patient. I mean, like, well, Jennifer Aniston, where Pitt is Jennifer Aniston. But then Jennifer Aniston alone for the patient was Rachel. All this is a speculation. I cannot prove it, but I, I think that's the reason. Yes. Sorry, what's I, I go to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. What's the criteria for choosing the neurons, and where exactly the neurons I don't choose the neuron. I get whatever I have. So the surgeon will put the electrodes, and I record from 100 neurons simultaneously, and I test them all. OK, and then you will just give them pictures and see? I just show pictures, and I see if any neuron <coughs> responds to any picture I show. If I do find a neuron responding to any of the pictures, I will try many different pictures to see if it fires just to one of them or to the concept. But isn't it super unlikely that you find actually pictures that, I mean, no. if, if each neuron was really just firing to one specific concept? I never say that. OK. I never say that, eh. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Edmund? So in the monkey, we think these object cells are coding for object place associations very often. That is, they're trying to do an episodic memory task yeah. to remember where they have seen a particular person. Yes. So have you ever tried a place uh, where someone like Jennifer Anderson might be found? You just, you just, yeah, <laughs> it's coming in 10, 20 slides. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's interesting because then it implies it is acting a bit in the way an episodic memory device might. It is. Okay, I'm, I'm going ahead because I will show the data. We can discuss it with the data. But it never... The neuron never acts to the conjoint uh, representation. Never acts, it's not an and. Yeah. The neuron will not fire to Jennifer Aniston and the one thing, it fires to this or to that. <coughs> and can I just comment on that? Because you know, this is at the heart of this meeting. Yes. And the reason for that, presumably, is so that you can retrieve the whole memory yes. from either part of it, yes. either the place or the object. Yes. So it should not be and, it should be all. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes. Can hippocampus code two questions? Can hippocampus code for social relations in a way it can code for like ob object relations in, yes. in, in space? Yes. And the second one, um, what does the act of putting a label on a concept do? Oh, that's that's a discussion I want to have at the very end of of the second talk, because I I will be bold and I want I'm not sure of what I will say, but I want to discuss the role of language on creating this type of concept cells, right? So I think that would be an interesting discussion. Basically, I, I, can, I can tell you the, the story, but we can discuss it later. But I think, uh, Edmund, you will correct me, or Sylvia, I don't know if Sylvia is here, you will correct me. As, as far as I know, neurons like this, they were not seen in monkeys, and people have tried. It's not that, that people with such level of invariance and such level of abstraction, I think they're not, I mean, they're not that clear, I mean, that they haven't seen any monkeys. Now, and the question is, what is the difference? Maybe it's language. But this, I, I want to tell you this when I tell you about Borges. But, yeah. Can I just comment on the monkey question? Yes. So what I said before was, yes, you can get object cells, yeah. but they're not very good. You know, they don't fire many spikes, unless the monkey is doing a sort of object place memory task. Yes. And that's why I was really asking if your patients have associations of these objects or people with all sorts of things like places. I don't, I don't think they have associations with places. Mm. Uh, but having said that, you can never rule out that there's always uh, whatever we show is cueing something else. You can always argue that, well, maybe the patient Jennifer Aniston reminds the patient of the Hollywood sign, and maybe Brad Pitt reminds the patient of that. The thing is that in one recording, we can get like 20 neurons far into, I, I actually tell you the right number, 19 different neurons far into 32 different things. Some neurons far into more than one thing. And it's hard to imagine that this neuron far into this because it's thinking of that. This neuron far into that because it's thinking of that. This neuron far into that because it's thinking, thinking of that. Well, again, this is at the heart of this meeting. With distributed encoding, you would expect that. That's, uh, the distributed is a tricky word. Sparse distributed. Yes. 
Yes. So. Oh, my question is about the Maradona drama, actually. Yeah, after I love that one. Yeah. After that experiment, all the pictures you have shown are mostly like facial, or I mean, they're very still pictures without movement. Right? Uh, not the Maradona one. Not the Maradona one. So that's my question. With the Maradona pictures, I mean, even though the picture is still, yeah. the so, Maradona actually is moving in yeah. the pictures. I mean, how okay. do we make sure I love, I love discussing this. that you know, the cell actually is firing to the concept okay, let's, let's of movement rather than the concept of Maradona? Or the concept of Maradona moving, rather than the concept of Maradona staying still. Where is my list? It can be not the movement. It can be the elegance of Maradona driving the ball <laughs> and about to score against England. That's the way I like to see this neuron. So I think that's the most likely. No, actually. Um, if you, if you, that was published in current biology, this neuron. So if you see the paper, I can show you later, so I don't have it because there are way too many neurons. But the same neuron fired to two different pictures of Maradona. One is holding the World Cup like this, 1986. But the other one, wait, 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 wait. But the other one is Maradona, 20, 30 years later, with beer, like much fatter, with wearing a tie, I mean, which he seldom does, and the neuron also fires. And therefore, it's not the situation, because for me, that, that, that triggers very, very specific memories, right, of, of this game and so on. But the neuron didn't fire just to this picture, fire to completely different instances of Maradona, and <coughs> with decades away from each other. Have you tried another uh, player? No, for Brazilians, it doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> no, there are no neurons for Brazilian players. <laughs> Pelé, I mean, if, if I ever get a neuron far into Pelé, I quit science. <laughs> I will start writing books and doing something else. Yeah. yeah? Have you looked at the uh, spatial distribution of these concepts in the campus? Oh, give me, give me a bit of time. I will address this question. I want to touch this question, but with data. I will show you some data. Yes. Um, would your hypothesis be that these cells really encode, like, basically, like, throughout my life, the concept of Maradona or Jeff Hardison, or that? Sort of, you are um, you showing me a picture of Maradona triggers a shorter memory in my hippocampus of Maradona, and that then throughout the rest of the session. Okay, I tell you, I tell you the end of the story, but so that, so that you have an idea where I'm going, so then you can start having a picture of what the interpretation will be of the data. I tend to send this at the end, but for me there are two at least two different processes that happens. If I will see Maradona now. I will recognize him, and I do not need my hippocampus to recognize him, because HM didn't have the hippocampus and couldn't recognize person he knew from before the surgery. Yeah. Wait, wait. Now, I will call this, we can challenge that, but I will call this perceptual awareness. I know who the person is. I know it's Maradona, but that's it. I stop there. I mean, nothing comes back. But at some point, I mean, if I see Maradona, and that takes maybe 100 milliseconds, I can recognize Maradona, and there are neurons running to Maradona in my visual cortex. But immediately afterwards, many things related to Maradona come into awareness. That I would call more like contextual uh, awareness. Is you don't just know that he's Maradona, you know that he's the football player that made you happy in 1986, and you know he's the guy that is talking crap whenever they interview him, and you start knowing many things, and you know how he looks like, and you know how he may smell like, or whatever thing that, so it's multisensory. So I think the hippocampus is bringing together all these memories and all these sensations that are related to Maradona. But that comes much later. Recognition is 100 milliseconds, these neurons fire at 300 milliseconds, which is way, way later. Yeah. Yes, so, so that would sort of imply that your hypothesis is that it's indeed truly encoding Maradona sort of throughout your life. Okay. Not necessarily, no. No, because I will show you neurons now firing, for example, I, not, I don't, I, maybe I have one to myself. There, are neurons, there were neurons firing to myself. And I did this recording 10 years ago. And I doubt the patient will still have neurons firing to me because I doubt the patient will still remember who I am, right? Yeah. And now, this is what Jadine discussed. Actually, the, paper may, the, paper, the patient may remember who I am, but will not have experiences, recall of experiences. Yeah, I remember you were coming, I mean, to the hospital ward and you were wearing this uh, shirt and this and that and we talk about this. This is gone. And I think if this is gone, this is what we call episodic memories, it's because these neurons, they start representing something else. So it's not that this neuron will stay forever encoding Maradona. Yes? Have you ever trained it on like a new concept, new person? 
person, for example, and then see yes. how, how it's like the, the it's, neuron it's, reacted before and after training. It's very hard. It's very hard to get neurons far into things that are unknown to the patient. The only thing, yeah, actually, I have one example where this does happen, and I want to show you this next, and then I, I, I move on a bit with the slides. Okay. <laughs> Let me show you first another neuron. It comes after this one. I will show you the two most important neurons for the rest of the day, I mean, of my talks. Pay attention to these two neurons. They're my favorite ones, especially this one. That's my very favorite neuron. Look at the baseline, zero. I show a picture of Luke Skywalker. The neuron fires very strongly. Edmund, you know who Luke Skywalker is? No. <laughs> From Star Wars. <laughs> I knew I would catch you with this one. <laughs> so there's a very famous movie called Star Wars, uh, which people tend to see. And there's a character called Luke Skywalker. And we showed three different pictures of him. And look, we have three good responses. Again, the baseline is, is zero, but you show the right picture, boom, the neuron goes crazy. We wrote the name Luke Skywalker, the neuron fires, and this is the name Luke Skywalker said by two different voices, which I will play now. Luke Skywalker. So that's, it's a computer synthesized voice, male voice, that was this one. Luke Skywalker. And that's the female voice. Doesn't matter which voice you use, I mean, you get a good response. But that's not the interesting bit. There's something more interesting than that. Do you see that? You see what happens? This. And you know who this is? For Edmund's sake, this is Yoda. It's another character from the same movie, right? From Star Wars. More important. So, sorry? It's the more important one. The most important <laughs> one. Yoda, exactly. Master it. One time I gave a talk. One time I gave a talk because people say, oh, yeah, it's Yoda. And one time one guy said, this is Master Yoda. I said, oh, that. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. I mean, it's not just Yoda. Now, that's a very important point which this neuron is making. And that's not that uncommon. And somebody say the neuron fires only to Jennifer Aniston. I never say that. This neuron is actually proving that this might not be the case. The neurons may fire to more than one thing. And this is not that uncommon. But they're still extremely selective. If I will show 100 things, the neuron will fire to one or two, not to 20 or to 50. So that's what we call a sparse coding, ultra sparse coding. It's not what people will call grandmother cell coding. That's the neuron firing to one and only one thing. No. And even if I see a neuron firing to only one thing, I cannot rule out that the neuron is also firing to something I didn't show in my experiment, right? So I never claim these are grandmother cells. I think it's wrong to claim that. Now, let me finish the argument, and then we can move to questions again. But if the neuron fires to more than one thing, is it still true that the neuron will tend to fire to the concept, not to just any picture of anything? And second, and most importantly, the two things the neuron fire to, they tend to be associated. It's not anything. I mean, these two guys are from the same movie. The neuron firing to Jennifer Aniston also fired to Lisa Kudrow, not to just a random actress. Well, they are two who are doing the same TV series, Friends. Right? So keep this in mind. That's, that's become very, very important later. Yeah? What do you mean by dominant and frequency? Uh, the, the frequency of a of neuron is uh, is charging into some kind of a pattern, right? Yeah. Is it, uh, you mean if there's a temporal profile in the firing? Yes. No. Is, is it a, like a pattern, like a burst, no. like irregular firing? No, it's, it's irregular. You have to, this is a Mickey Mouse thing, what I will say. I mean, we may find examples where it's wrong, but this very precise temporal uh, firing they tend to be more common in early sensory areas. Because then you get synchronization of neurons, they are encoding the same thing, the same or related features at the same time, and they move the information forwards. Now when you get so high up, this temporal coding, if there was any at the end, tends to pass more into a rate coding. I mean the timing gets lost somehow and it's more like a sustained firing for some period of time. Now the period of time is very short actually. The firing of these neurons, most of it is within a 200 milliseconds band, two, 300 milliseconds, from 300 milliseconds up to 500, 600. And then, in many cases, it goes down immediately. Is there any coherence with uh, some waves in range? With some, what, waves? Uh, yes, some coherence. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 
Uh, it's a pro I, I took out this slide, it was too much, but I, I can tell you the story. Uh, I have to tell you the story because I, I took out the slides. I have other data I wanted to show. Now, I'll tell you the whole... Give me, give me a minute because it's, it's best to tell you the data with, with experiment <coughs> that's coming next. There, there was another question with that? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, did you... I uh, probably won't have time to do that too much, but so you're basically saying that these neurons um, fire more to semantic <coughs> fields, right, than to one specific concept. What do you call semantic? Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> no, like um, a kind of um, related concept that are yes. for the person itself yes. somehow related. So yes, so exactly, exactly. Okay. The, the last experiment I will show is, is going exactly to this issue. Okay, okay. so you, you will find like a gradient with things that like looking at things that you think would be somehow related to this? Wait, let's not speculate because I do have the data. Okay. Let me show you the data and then we can discuss it. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I, I, I back up. I, I think, I, I, would I have half an hour more? Well, we're supposed to have coffee in 10 minutes. But, uh, okay, I, I, won't, I won't show this data, but i tell you the story. Um, this is published, the current biology from 2015. The neurons, they fire extremely late. So if you sh if even if you flash a picture, you just flash it for 30 milliseconds, and the patient recognizes the picture, the neuron will fire at 300 milliseconds, which is an eternity. You just flash a picture that the neuron likes. I mean, the neuron fires to Halle Berry. You just flash Halle Berry. Then 30 milliseconds after you flash it, you put a mask to avoid after perception in the retina, so the picture is not there anymore. The neuron doesn't do anything, and at 300 milliseconds, the neuron will fire very reliably every single trial. Now that was puzzling us because it's like, well, what is the mechanism for have such a reliable response so late? And that goes to the question you were asking. This response is always preceded by a local field deflection in theta. So if you take the power in theta band, in, it is humans, it's not rodents. So in our cases, four to eight hertz, you see that there's a power increase in theta that shortly precedes by about 100 milliseconds the firing of the neuron. That's the main relationship we have between local field responses and spike responses. And if, I, if we have 10 minutes, I have to, I have to move on because I, I'm not going to show you anything otherwise. Uh, so I show you the previous neuron, which was very interesting. Now I show you this neuron, which is also very interesting. Why is this neuron interesting? Because this neuron is firing to Arne. Three pictures of him, his name said, I mean, his name written in the computer, here it reads Arne and his name saved by the computer. And why is this interesting? Because Arne was one of the guys doing experiments with me. I mean, he was doing another task. And why is this interesting? Because the patient didn't know Arne before, right? Arne was new to the patient. We never interact with the patient before they come to hospital. I mean, like before they are in the, in the hospital ward. So I know that the patient had never seen Arne a day or two before I did this recording. So I know that this conceptual representation can be created relatively quickly. And that's, that's the data that I have to answer your point. I mean, like, you can have responses to things that are relatively novel. And we have many responses like that. Even if there is a response, to, for example, Jennifer Aniston, can I extend the, the context, so the, the associations of the patient, and then see responses? Yes, yes, to, yes, yes. You know? You're great. I mean, you're describing like the experiments. <laughs> Yeah? So the only thing I do when I give talks is just I listen to the questions, I write them down, and then I, I, do, I do the experiments because they're good questions. So I will skip my stuff about consciousness. And um, we started late, so can I have like a bit of time? I can I show two experiments? Sorry, and whose fault was it you started late? <laughs> <laughs> didn't we start late? It was. I was waiting for Haim. I didn't want him to. Oh. He, he just missed the, you missed just the first slide, which I know well, Haim will know it. So. Now, that's related to Edmund's question. So imagine that, OK, let's go back from the previous two neurons that I told you. So far, anecdotal, anecdotal observation. Hey, there are neurons that fire to more than one thing, but these things are associated. So the neurons seem to be encoding associations. That I will prove in the very first part of this, of this part of this talk. One thing. The other thing, the neuron fires to myself, or another neuron fires to Arne, my colleague. So this representation can be created quickly. I mean, within a day or two, or maybe less. Now the question was, putting these two things together, can we actually change the tuning of the neuron, and I think somebody said exactly this, this word, by 
inducing an association. And that's what Edmund said. So, morning practice. Imagine that you have a neuron firing to Julia Roberts, and the neuron does not fire to the White House at all. But now I start showing the picture, kind of like a fake selfie of Julia Roberts in the White House. What will the neuron do? Will the neuron start firing to the White House as well? Because now Julia Roberts is somehow linked to the White House. And we ask the patients to remember that. Remember where was Julia Roberts? I mean, later they have to tell you, yeah, Julia Roberts was in the White House. And we have many of these pairs. We can show them six pairs, eight pairs, so we make it not that easy. So they have to remember who was where. And let's see what happens. And that was done by Matthias. Um, so this is a neuron that, to start with, was firing into a picture of the daughter of the patient. I cannot show her face, no, out of confidentiality. It fired very strongly. The neuron did not fire to the Eiffel Tower at all. And we still didn't show the picture that Matthias did of the daughter in the Eiffel Tower. We're still not showing that. So we are, we're making clear that the neuron does not fire to the Eiffel Tower and fires to the daughter. But now we start showing the picture of the daughter in the Eiffel Tower, and of course the neuron fires, because the neuron likes the daughter. The neuron keeps firing to the daughter, but the neuron starts firing to the Eiffel Tower as well. I'll show you another example. We can go the other way around. Now we can start with a neuron firing to a place. Imagine that there's a neuron firing to the White House, but not to this volleyball player. She's very famous in America, right? The patient knew her very well. We're still not showing the picture, but the moment we start showing the picture of this uh, woman, I think it's Kerry Walsh, in the White House, of course the neuron keeps firing to the White House, but we'll also start firing to Kerry Walsh. Yes? Would you call that a spatial view cell? Because uh, the patient is not in the White House, but is looking at a spatial view of the White House. I will call it a conceptual association. Is Kerry Walsh in, in the White House? Okay. Yes? I think one very interesting control would be, like if we, we just saw the picture of the White House and uh, uh, Julia Roberts in front of it, uh, and if you see the same picture of the White House, you somehow complete it in your mind with Julia Roberts in front of it now, we would see it because we just saw it. It would be super interesting actually to do this with an other picture of the White House. No Sorry, say it again, I didn't get it. Okay. So Imagine that you have the, the neuron white fires to what, to Julia Roberts? To yeah, start so, with? So, so, so the neuron fires to Julia Roberts, and you show the White House in the background. Yeah. And then in the end, it's starting, uh, have increased firing here uh, for, for the White House itself. Yes. Like you're showing the same picture of the White House yes. with uh, Julia Roberts. Yes. So you are saying you can show a different picture of the yeah, White House. This would be, yes. I think, an interesting control. Yes. 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 And also, doesn't it work like cross sensory? So oh, that's. If I that's what of his poster? Yeah, so, <laughs> like, look, okay. So yeah. if you say you talk about Julia Roberts being in the White House, not showing the White House at all with her in, in, in combination, but you still see something to Julia Roberts that you only saw to the White House before. So we actually, like, I, I will invite, I will not give you the answer now, but I invite you to uh, my poster. So <laughs> this, is, this is like <laughs> when your team is playing one nil and then you say, hey, hey discount, eh? <laughs> this doesn't count against my time. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. No, so like, we don't find like a long-term change in the firing like to the, if you do a cross-mobile association, for example, with the sound. It's not, you, uh, like, it's not uh, reacting to the sound afterwards. So, but I can like we can talk about this later. Yeah. Okay, I want to show you two interesting things. One, one is like the classic thing that you will see. Uh, this is the population plot. It's okay, but I mean, it shows that it's, it's a reliable finding. This is the response to the picture of the neuron originally preferred, right? So this is before learning, and we can quantify learning because the subjects can tell us who was where. I mean, they're humans. They can talk and they can tell us. And this is after learning. So there's a little bit of decay, and that's known. I mean, that we described earlier, and other people describe it as repetition suppression. If you show one thing many times, the, re the response starts going down a little bit. It never goes to baseline, no? It stays very high, but it goes a bit down. <coughs> Learning is that the subject remembering where was the person or who was in each person. So we have two tasks. We ask who was in the White House, and they have to get the person right. And later we have another task. We say, where was Julia Roberts? Now, they have many pairs. They don't just have one person in one place. They have like eight people in eight different places. And then we can quantify how long it takes them to learn each specific association. So this response, this formation of association is only, after, only when you have a task. If you don't have a task, uh, 
No, you can, you can do it. What we did, I don't have the data, but it, it's in the paper. What we did is, after we formed the association, we just did a simple picture presentation, and the neuron will still encode the association. So you can always say, well, they're still remembering the association they did before, but we wanted to see what happens now if there's no task anymore. I mean, if now we just show the pictures and we tell the subjects do nothing, you still have the neuron fire to the associated ones. In many cases, not always. But in many cases, you still have it. Yes, yes, this is a task, yes, yes. And this, this, is, this is, well, I, I come into this in the, next, in the next experiment. So what's the problem with having a task? No, I, I, I thought that this is kind of automatic associations that are formed. Yeah, so what we... Still from you what we... An iron shock. Really? Wow. So what, what we do is we show all the pictures, then we show one set, I mean, one go of these selfies, they, con they, they conjoint pictures, and then we show all the pictures again together. And then in the, in, the third, in the next block, we ask them, who was here, who was there? Now, when we show the pictures, individual pictures, they're still not doing anything, but they're actually remembering who was where. So again, we, we show, the, the, we show this, this, these joint pictures, all of them one after the other in random order, and then we show the individual ones. And after we show them all, we ask them, who was here, who was there, who was there? Then we start again, next trial. We show them all again, and then we show them independently. And then we ask again, who was here, who was there, who was there? When I show you this here, we are not asking here now. This is just a presentation, picture presentation. Yes? Yeah, so when we find the sounds, we have the task to identify who was there. Uh, when we connect sounds to uh, persons or uh, sounds to uh, objects, then we uh, then we see a response when you have this task. When you, in the end, when you show just the, um, just the sound itself, we get a much lower response or, or like not a significant increased response uh, on the population level. Like this, this is at least what, uh, what we have the sounds to find. Okay, let me show you the two things I wanted to show you. <laughs> this one is okay, the next one is a very interesting one, for me at least. So this is the response to the picture the neuron initially like, and this is the response to the picture we create the association with, right? So this is before learning, this is after learning. So it goes against the initial tendency of repetition suppression, actually you have an increase because of building the association. And if we take non-associated pictures, so pictures that were also presented, but they were not associated to this particular neuron, there's no difference, right? So it's selective, it's only for the picture that you are, for the place that you're associated to the person or the person you're associated to the place. Now, the most interesting come now, comes now. Let's see how this evolves trial by trial. So this is behavior. I mean, this is how good or bad the subjects did with the different repetitions. I mean, I will repeat this experiment like 15 times or so. So they start very poorly, but then it starts going up. Behavior in green. You know? They start getting better and better, and they start getting who was where. If you look at the neuron responses to the associated pictures, right, you start having a very low response, but then this slowly starts going up as the patient starts remembering the association, right? But the interesting thing is that this is an average, and different pictures, the patients will take different amount of trials to remember them. So they may take one trial to remember the association of the daughter in whatever it was, and maybe six trials to remember the volleyball player in whatever she was. So each patient will take a different number of trials to remember each of the pairs. And different patients will take different number of trials. So what happens if I now align and I call trial zero the trial where they learn the association? And the negative trials will be before they learn the association for each pair and then positive after. This is what we get. Again, behavior is very steep. Well, but that's because of construction. I mean, this is the time they learned. I look at the neural data now in black. It gets also very steep, right? And this is trial zero, the trial when they learn the association. So it takes them one trial, really, and then the neuron will start encoding the association. And why this is important? Because of what Jadin said in his lecture, episodic memory is a one trial thing, right? You see, uh, I don't know, you see somebody passing by, and you see the person only one time, and you may remember this for the rest of your life. And this person is not passing by 100 times because you need 100 trials to get the neurons to start encoding an association. This doesn't happen in real life. You say things like this, and you may remember it your whole life, right? And it happened once. 
So there has to be somewhere in the brain that is encoding this first shot, this first association, and then this gets reconsolidated and so on. But somebody has to have some encoding with one trial. Well, actually, these neurons do that. Yes? Does this kind of encoding have anything to do with the age of the patients? No. no. Why, to the, why with the age? Because we should be at least a little bit better than we are younger. But I also think that I mean, we don't have much age variability with patients that are candidate to surgery, no? I mean, you won't get a patient with 50 years old. I mean, especially they, they should have done it earlier. Yeah. So usually you get teenagers and early 20s. That, that's the typical range. Okay. I show you the final experiment, and then we do a break. And then I, I talk a bit about Borges, just, just to change a bit. Um, the final experiment actually starts with this one. And I start with two problems. One was then was mentioned by Ham, but maybe it's not exactly what you were mentioned. I tell you the worst problem of all. When I ask Matthias, how many times does this work that we get uh, the neurons having a significant encoding that I mean, the, uh, the response to associated picture is significant? And his answer was 40% of the times. So of the neurons, he tested that that he created the association. 40% of the times, the response will be higher to associated concept after learning. And that was way too high. Why? Because you can imagine that if you start associating concepts, or whatever, items, whatever you want to call it, and if the chance of the neuron in calling these associations is as high as 40%, then everything gets associated with everything else. Because uh, I have a neuron that, I mean, you may, or you may have a neuron in your brain that is far into me and you associate it with Simon. And there's a 40% chance that the neuron will follow this. But Simon is associated to, to Luz or uh, Simon is associated to Haim and so on. So then the neuron, with high chance, will start falling to everything. And everything will end up associated with everything else. So I wasn't very happy with the 40%. And what we speculated at the time in this paper is that, well, maybe it's the first wave, it's an initial encoding of something that is novel, but not all these neurons will keep these associations. Not all these neurons will consolidate this association, right? Maybe just a fraction of them will consolidate these associations. The second point, that's the first one. The second point is that, related to what Heim says, well, the patients are doing a task. They're doing an association task. They are explicitly doing a memory task. So maybe the neurons are encoding this because that's their job then, and one day later they're doing something else. So what we did is something very silly, but I like it because it was reusing the data we already had. And that was something very brilliant that was done by a student that is finishing now called Emanuela. So we studied long-term associations. So what did we do? We went to the screening sessions. And the screening session is just, we're just showing pictures. That's it. And remember that I showed you there was a neuron firing to Luke Skywalker and Yoda. There was another one firing to Jennifer Aniston and Lisa Kudrow. So the question was, well, if you take like all these neurons, if a neuron fires to more than one thing, are these things associated or not? Is this just <coughs> an, an not an anecdotal observation that I showed with a couple of neurons, or there's really something, a clear tendency on that? So the, what Emanuela did was the following. I mean, Emanuela went back to the data, and we have, for example, a neuron that fired to three basketball players, and they are from the LA Lakers. I mean, the, all this was done in Los Angeles. And finally, also to this guy who was the trainer of the LA Lakers, Phil Jackson. And what we had, since we're doing recordings in humans, we can do something very simple. We can ask the patient how much you associate this guy with this one, or this guy with this one, and so on. So we get a ranking, I mean, we, we choose some set of pictures, and we ask them to rank how much they associate them with each other. And basically, if you get, I don't know, Phil Jackson, which is this one here, is highly associated to this guy, is highly associated to this guy, is also highly associated to this guy, 24, mm, is here. The neuron is not firing much to this one. So if you ask the patient how much these things are associated with each other, the neuron encodes some of the associations, not all of them, right? But the neuron will not fire randomly to anything. We'll tend to fire to things that are associated, not to all the associated things, to some of them. And we have many examples like that. And basically, if you take all the association scores to things the neuron fire, or a neuron fire, the association score were relatively high. 
And that's normalized with the cell score normalization. That's why you have negative values here, because different patients will tend to give ranking in a different way, right? So we normalize this, and we put together results for a few patients, and then we got this is the association score for things the neurons fire to, and these are the other association scores. And this difference is highly significant. So if we ask the patient, the neurons tend to fire to things that are related for the patients according to their scores. Now, the problem with this is that we're a bit limited because if we show 100 pictures, and if you ask to rate 100 pictures against 100 pictures, one against each other, you end up having like 5,000 pairs, right? So you cannot ask a patient to do like 5,000 scores. So then we came up with <coughs> something very simple, which is a matrix of association that comes from web searches. You take Google. And it's very simple. Say, Brad Pitt is associated to Jennifer Aniston because they were married and so on. So if you do a search of Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt, you will get a huge number of hits. There are way too many pages talking about Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. And then you can normalize this by the number of hits you get to Jennifer Aniston alone multiplied by the number of hits you get to Brad Pitt alone. And that's the metric we use. And we put a logarithm to have it better defined. And that's a metric that other people use for other applications, actually. We found out later. So if you get all the pictures we use in all the recordings, in 10 years of recordings or so, I mean, Emanuela ranked the pictures here against each other. And you see that there are some clusters. And this is not by chance. It's because Emanuela ordered these pictures. And here you have experimenters very much associated with each other, like Arne and myself, uh, actors like me and Brad Pitt and things like that, <laughs> like <t> TV people, musicians, sport people. So you see you have many clusters. And if you go to sport people, I mean, here I think there are basketball players, football players, and so on. So this seems to make sense, the coding we, I mean, we define with the web. Now, what we did is the following. Imagine now that you have a neuron firing to Brad Pitt and the Taj Mahal, for any reason. So you go to Brad Pitt, you go to the Taj Mahal, and, and you say, well, how much is the association score? And you compare it to the other association scores. So that's what we did. And with the web metrics, again, we found that things that neuron fire to, they're much more associated that, than other things. But the difference is not as high as if you ask the patient. Because maybe for the patient, Brad Pitt is associated to Tokyo because the patient saw Ocean Eleven while being in Tokyo. But that's not an association you will see on the web. I mean, as something remarkable. That's just for the patient. It's his own personal experience. So if you ask the patient, the difference is actually this difference is significantly higher than this difference, right? So the neurons start to follow the association, but more the specific associations for the patient, which is more related to episodic memory on personal experiences. Two more things, and then I will, I will stop. You can ask a different question, which is very interesting. And the, all this is for free. I mean, we have the data collected already, and we said, OK, when we did a spike sorting, and we took two neurons that are close to each other, but we can tell apart because of the different spike shapes. <coughs> if one neuron fires to one thing, and the next one fires to something else, are these two things associated or not? You understand the difference? What I have shown you so far is, you have one neuron, and the neuron fires to two things. These two things are associated. That's a very strong tendency. But now you have two neurons that are close to each other. We can tell apart based on spike sorting, what we talked before. And this neuron fires to one thing, and this other neuron fires to a different thing. Are these two things associated? The answer is no, not at all. So let me, let me. Eh? Do you have any information? No, no, because we have the brush of electrodes coming out. So just a second. So this is the association score for nearby neurons. And this is the rest of association scores. So in more technical terms, this is telling us that in the hippocampus, in the hippocampus formation, there's a non-topographic organization. That means close by neurons, they don't tend to fire to similar things. And that's very handy, because if you want to do memory, having a non-topographic organization, or let's put it in another words, having a random organization of things, so the chance of this neuron connecting to this one is the same as connecting to that one, and that pictures can be anywhere allows you to associate anything to anything else in one trial. Now, if you have all the actors here with all the actor neurons here, and if you have all the places here with all the place neurons here, and then you want to do an association between the Taj Mahal and Brad Pitt, I mean, you have to go across different areas and so on, and it may take you a while to make this connection. If everything is everywhere, 
You're just connecting one trail, anything with whatever you want. And we know that there's particularly one area in the hippocampus, which I think is the only one in the whole brain which has a massive recurrent connectivity. All the neurons are connected to each other. It's called CA3. Yeah. So you have the data of how quickly people learn the associations between two different things, right? The kind of yes. And you have the topographical information. Um, so are associations made faster if the neurons are close to each other or not? No. So no, because this, this shows you that it can be anywhere. Yeah, OK, it can be anywhere. But is there still an advantage to two No, but I, I mean, when I'm doing the association, I never have two neurons close to each other. I always have one neuron that fires to A, and I make it fire to B. I don't have a neuron firing to B that I make a fire to A at the same time. I, I mean, we could have done the experiment, we didn't do it. Now, the final, the final bit of data, and I will stop, I promise. Um, that say, that, that's what saved us. That I was so relieved when I saw this result, because now here we said, if you have a neuron firing to a particular concept or picture, what is the probability of the neuron to fire to a second concept as a function of the association with the first? If I have a neuron firing to Bill Clinton, what is the probability that the neuron will fire also to whatever, to the Taj Mahal that maybe has nothing to do with Bill Clinton, so the association score will be very low between Taj Mahal and Bill Clinton, and what is the probability of the neuron firing to Hillary Clinton, which is highly linked to Bill Clinton? The association score is higher. And the probability goes up, I mean, with this sig model function, psychophysics function, right? And what I really like the most is that it's not really rising up to 40%, it saturates for the most associated things Saturates at 4%. And that's something I can live with. Because if the chance of creating an association is 4% four, 4%, instead of 40, well, then everything, I don't know, I cannot say because we need to run simulations to that, but I feel more confident that everything doesn't get associated with everything else. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. Um, did you maybe check how these associations will affect the neuron itself? So in what up. sense? Um, so when you create an association, and so the distance to the associated object in that, in that scale that you have, does that differentially affect the, the firing of the, for the first object? So the, 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 the object that is actually is associated with uh, in the beginning? When I do the experiment with the associations, yes. no. Uh, because I was wondering if, if uh, doing associations that are closer would reinforce more the, the firing of this. No, we didn't see. No, well, we don't have it closer because we're always doing, on purpose, person with places. And that's, by the way, we're going to episodic memory, and Jadim will be very right in criticizing me, saying, hey, hey, wait a second, that's not real. That's not episodic memory. Because a person and a place is the standard associative coding thing. It's very far from episodic memory. But that was our first study. I, I wanted to start with this. I said, well, I want to know if I'm completely wrong or if I might be on the right track. So let's start with pairwise associations. And we went with person and places, because that, that's the classic first skeleton on, uh, of an episodic memory. So one year from now, I will remember meeting you, uh, I mean, in this place, which I can still pronounce. I mean, like, <laughs> Oberberg or whatever it's called. <laughs> so that would be the, the first thing that is on which the episodic memory of things that I, re I remember related to you will build up. It's not just that. There are many more associations and many more things. But that, that was the first thing. And for this experiment, we started with person and places. So we don't have similar things. Okay. Yeah, the, the, question, the general question, I guess, is just whether you can make this associative field stronger or weaker by, by creating associations that are very impossible or very kind of more plausible, if you want. Also I don't think so. I mean, there's nothing like plausible and implausible in episodic memory. An elephant in the Eiffel Tower. Well, I just saw a cartoon of an elephant in the Eiffel Tower. Everything makes sense for episodic. I mean, what does it make sense? You can link anything with anything else. And you cannot tell me, well, you cannot possibly do this association because it doesn't make sense. Why? I can see a movie or a cartoon with whatever thing you name with whatever thing else you name. That's the point of having a random organization. Because the machinery of the hippocampus allows you to create any link quickly. Yeah, but if you have a semantic field, I, I think you that don't. some, some items would be You don't. Be better in, you don't. You don't. Okay. Not here. In cortex, yes, but not in the hippocampus. Yes? If, if, um, if 
the new semantic concept somehow is speaking against the old semantic concept. So, for example, I know that for gravity reasons, it's impossible that an, uh, an elephant is flying over the for, over the other tower. And you say, I mean, concepts are interrelated, and the common neurons are. Interrelated. I tell you, I tell you a story. I tell you a story. I just read a novel of somebody that got a um, Nobel Prize, which is an amazing story, which is so emotional, it's actually about Dumbo flying over the Eiffel Tower. And will you remember the story? Well, maybe yes, and it's an elephant flying over the Eiffel Tower, and you will remember it, so you can make the association between the Eiffel Tower and an elephant quickly. Okay, so no delay. The story is this, uh, do you have a story? <laughs> eh? Should I make up a story? I don't know, I say, uh, no, no, I, I, was, I was just joking, I don't have a story. So we, should we do the break now and then we, we speculate and we have more fun? All right, thanks.